Hey guys, happy Easter. So the eruption in Iceland, what's going on there? This is quite interesting. So we know there used to be like seven to eight openings where lava was spilling out. Um, it has been reduced to basically three main craters that were really building up, really building craters where the lava was coming out. And uh, the northernmost crater was the most active and still is. And it seems that of the three craters, the one that's the southernmost seems to have died down and the other two ones still show activity. But the scientists, as so often, they don't agree on what is going to happen or what will happen in the future. And uh, yeah, guys, you know, before we start, I need to have some coffee so that we can get through this because it is quite interesting. Thorwald or Thorwald Zahn, he's a professor at the University of Iceland. He is saying something that then the other ones are basically reversing or saying different. It is interesting. There's a lot of theories. I mean, basically, does it come down to they don't know anything? We will have to see. I want you to hear it first and then let's see what we can get out of this. So he says, Thorwald or Thorwazen, he thinks that this might be the last event that we're seeing in the Sudnuka Crater series. You know, this chain of event started on November 10th with that magma intrusion that has formed that 15 kilometer long magma dike that was basically going from the Sudnuka Crater series underneath Grindavik into the sea. But at that time, there was enough room for the magma to spread so it didn't come to the surface. And then we've seen an eruption in December, then we've seen one in January, we've, we've seen one in February, we've seen another intrusion on March 2nd, and then we've seen another eruption mid-March, and that one's still going. So at, during the last few months, the experts have said, well, you know, this could last for decades, this could last for years, this could last even longer, because the Rakhianis Peninsula did wake up from being dormant for 800 years and that was valuable information especially for the town of Grindavik who has been rattled a lot by these events because these events usually come with earthquakes and the intrusion on November 10 10th really hit the town hard so a lot of fissures have opened cracks sinkholes it has really destroyed the infrastructure of the town and then before each eruption, it rattled again, fissures were getting longer and open. There was even um, an eruption right at the doorstep of the town that burned three homes down. So that's why the residents are leaving the government. They're having a plan to buy out the homes of the residents. So it doesn't look good for the town of Grindavik. But, you know, could this end now or is it moving somewhere else? I want to hear from Thorwald or Thorwalds and first. I really like that guy and you know I quote him quite often in my videos because I always have a feeling he tells it as it is and he doesn't sugarcoat things and he also often gives warnings just in my last video that I released yesterday about the White Island tragedy in New Zealand where tourists were on that island and then an eruption happened and a lot of people lost their lives or were badly burned and he drew a comparison with the Askia volcano in Iceland and he said this is dangerous and if we're not careful the White Island incident could happen here in Iceland so he said that and he also said like a while ago you know even Reykjavik or the surrounding suburbs there, they need to think about how to protect themselves from future lava flows because we see it in the Bluffyol area. There was a volcanic eruptions in the very past and we see lava flowing reaching the capital area. So he is quite realistic about things and I don't think that he's someone that's sticking together with some authorities and saying, oh, let's not say that, that's not good. He, he, I think he's quite open about things. So he says that the productivity in this eruption has clearly reduced. And uh, he says the heat flow from the crater is now reduced. So they have done some images that seem to confirm that. So he is a professor of volcanology at the University of Iceland. And uh, so 
he says in light of the new satellite images, that's why he's coming to that conclusion. And he says when we see the thermal images that have been conducted, it seems like the thermal flow is decreasing and that indicates that the productivity is being reduced little by little. And he says, and this ends up with only one path with the eruption dying down and eventually stopping. So he also says that the lava that's coming out, what's what's surrounding it and everything, it has become darker, meaning not as like liquid and hot anymore. It looks like it's cooling down. And he thinks when you look at previous eruptions that this is a sign that the activity is gradually slowing down. And of course, he says this can still keep going for the next few days. And he says, I'm, we're not talking here that this could end in the next hour or so. So it could drag on a little longer. It, it may take days or it may take weeks, but he thinks that there are clear indication that this thing will end. And he says, if you look at the land rise underneath Sorotsangi, that's where the Blue Lagoon and the power plant are located, the land rise has become quite flat. That's what he's saying. So there's this magma chamber underneath the Sorotsangi area at a depth of around five kilometers. And that has been fed by a larger magma reservoir that's way deeper down there. And that land has been rising because that shallow magma chamber has been filling up. And that seems to, that land rise seems to have slowed down. And it seems that the magma that's coming out of the eruption is being fed right from the magma reservoir, runs through the magma chamber and right out into the eruption. So, Four to five kilometers underneath Swartzengi, it seems that this magma chamber is no longer receiving magma, according to Thorwaldur. And so if the flow comes straight up from the deep magma reservoir, that is 10 to 15 kilometers down deep, he says it reminds him of the first volcanic eruption that happened at the Fagradalsfjall volcanic system in 2021. He says the activity in the crater that is active right now is similar to what it was in the first weeks of the Fagradalsfjall eruption. And it was characterized by a weak magmatic activity because if the magma chamber is full, there's a lot of pressure and then it's more intense. Right now it's weak, but it still seems to be able to keep its flow coming from that deeper storage chamber. And he says, if the flow, if what's coming out of that deeper storage chamber, if that drops below two to three cubic meters per second, then this eruption that we have going in Iceland right now will end. And maybe it takes a few more weeks or days, but if that's the flow rate, then he says the end is near. And then he also says that cycle that we see in the Sutnuka crater series that started basically on November 10th is complete. So what does that mean? Does that mean, oh, Grindavik can be revived again? Or does that mean something else? So he says there is good news in this announcement that it's dying down. He says he believes that when the current eruption is over, that the activity in the Sutnuka crater series will end. And he says that he doesn't expect that another event will happen in the Sutnuka crater series. But he also says, well, that's not that I'm saying that it can happen somewhere else, but the question is where, right? Because there is still Grindavik, there's the Blue Lagoon, there's Swartzangi, there's that Altverb that's west of Grindavik. So he says, because what we see now, that magma has come from a deeper magma reservoir and the land rise has stopped right now underneath Swartzangi. 
He thinks that this process that we've been seeing since November 10th, intrusion, lands rising again, eruption, lands rising again, eruption, lands rising again, intrusion, lands rising again, eruption, and now lands not rising again. So he says what has started on November 10th is over. And he says, in my opinion, those events have been related to magma flowing from this deeper magma reservoir into the more shallow magma chamber. So he says when the shallower magma chamber was full, it has emptied out, it has sent the magma on its way. And that's why we saw these events, these intrusions and eruptions. They were a result of that magma chamber emptying out because it had reached its point of maximum elasticity. So then there was so much pressure, it needed to go somewhere. And that's what has been driving these activities in the Sutnuka crater area since November 10th. How did this all start? It was started by plate separation. We know there's two tectonic plates that are not meeting each other underneath Iceland, like in other areas, they're not pushing towards each other. They're moving away from each other, which gives magma the way to come up to the surface. And he thinks that has been driven by that. And he says this cycle where this shallower small magma chamber fills and empties, it's over. This is an indication that the events at the Sutnuka Crater series will end. And then the activity could move somewhere else and the big question in the room is where how far away from that area and he says every earthquake every tremor that we see in these areas tells us a story and he says there is seismic activity at Tualadingia and the Krizovic volcanic system and he says that is interesting and there have been major earthquakes and, and rattling just recently. So he says, well, these earthquakes, they can be at a plate boundary of these two plates. And maybe this is a preparation for the next eruptions that could occur maybe further east of where they're occurring right now. But, you know, he also says that he cannot rule out an eruption that could start at Eltwerp. The Eltwerp, it's not so far away from Grindavik. It's basically at the doorsteps of Grindavik, just a little west of Grindavik. So if it starts there, they have said in the past, well, if that system moves on to Altwerp, um, that could be a longer eruption. And actually, when we had that March 2nd intrusion, where only a little bit of magma was flowing out of the chamber and then suddenly stopped, and then they thought, well, we will see an eruption in the next three days because the land's still rising. And then nothing happened. They thought, is the system moving on to Altwerp? But then it didn't. Like almost two weeks later, we saw the recent eruption, that the one that's still going. But maybe next time it's moving to Altwerp. So he says these earthquakes are telling us a story even if we understand them wrong or do not understand them or misinterpret them. But he says, we don't always see exactly what is going on at any given time. And it takes time to analyze the data that are coming in. And yes, volcanology is not a very advanced science. The, some scientists say, well, we know more what's going on on the moon than what is going on underneath our surface, underneath the Earth's crust. So he says it is quite possible that what is going on in Toladinia and Krizovic at the moment, that that will pave the way for magma to flow up to the surface if it's related to the plate boundaries moving away from each other. And he says that, you know, it's he really points that out, that it is important to look at all sides of this, at all possibilities, and not just be like blindfolded and say, this is what it is, this is what it is, right? And um, he thinks, he says, and that is an interesting sentence that he says, and it kind of gives me the feeling that there have been 
attempts to keep some stuff behind closed doors. He says, I also think it's important that scientists talk about it and inform people about these possibilities because it is part of this event and of the history of events. So he says the public has as much right to know about the uncertainty as the scientists. And I think he's absolutely right. And that's what I like about the guy. So what do other scientists say now that we know what his opinion is about what is going on? So another one of his colleagues at the University of Iceland said that it's not possible to state the end of the current eruption. He is Magnus Tumi Gudmundsen. He's a professor of geophysics at the University of Iceland. And he says that they cannot say that this eruption is over based on the information of the heat output that they have looked at, the heat images, the thermal images. Although he says, he admits, they certainly provide clues about the situation. So how does he evaluate the information that the research unit in volcanology and natural hazards at the University of Iceland has presented with data from satellites? So these images from the satellites show that there is heat radiation that's coming from the craters from the eruption that and that the heat radiation has been reduced completely. So that's why the scientists uh, think that this is an indication that it is coming to an end. Uh, the magma flow seems to have stabilized. It's quite, quite the same. Um, so it seems it's all balanced now, but you know, Magnus Tumi Gudmundsen says whether this will stop right now. There are so many speculations about it. Um, we just have to wait and see how things turn out. So yes, the eruption seems to be balanced because the land rise underneath Short Sangi has stopped and it's a sign that there is a balance between the inflow from the deeper magma reservoir um, and the magma into the craters. And that's why right now, as much magma is entering the magma chamber, the same amount is flowing out of the chamber. So there's nothing remaining in the chamber. It's a steady flow. It's a steady flow coming up from the deeper reservoir, flowing through the chamber and flowing right out in the eruption. And that's what they mean, balanced. It's kind of steady. Like if you have a garden hose, you turn on the water and it's a steady flow. So it's not like flowing into the magma chamber, waiting until this is full and then it's coming out. You don't have a water storage unit in between that would fill up first before it flows any further. So it's a steady flow. And he also says the experience shows us that nature often surprises us. So what does he mean by this? Well, he means by this, we can speculate and we can think we know, but we don't know. We know that we don't know. That's how I interpret this sentence. And he thinks that the events are different than what happened at the Fagradalsfjall eruptions. And remember, Thorwaldur kind of said it's something is similar. So he says what, when he was asked, what does it mean for the Sutnuka Crater series right now that this current eruption is lasting this long compared to how long the previous eruptions there have lasted? And he says the events at the Sutnuka Crater series are different than Fagradalsfjall. And the magma that, that's coming out here, we have seen that magma has gathered underneath the Swartzengi area at this depth of about four to five kilometers and then the pressure has built up and then magma was sent on its way. So that first happened for the first time on November 10th. That was the biggest event that took place, although this didn't end up with an eruption. But guys, it was forming this 15 kilometer long magma tunnel and sending magma on its way underneath Grindavik and almost reaching into the sea. So that was the biggest event. And you know, there was a lot of, lot of damage in Grindavik. So most of the damage and cracks and sinkholes and, and, and 
tilted homes and all that, that has happened on November 10th. But the magma didn't come up because there was enough space for the magma to spread out below underneath the crust. And that seems to be um, not the case anymore. That's why we have seen these continuous eruptions. So on November 10th, so much more magma was flowing out than combined in all the other events. So that was really, really a big event. A lot of room for the magma to flow into different areas was provided underneath the surface. And then, you know, then after that, we saw eruptions in December and then pressure was building up and then it came up with great force. So the December eruption started out quite, quite significant, like most eruptions. Um, but then the, the force really died down quickly. We see a big force first and then the pressure drops and then the flow drops and then sometimes that happens very quickly and then it dies out. We've seen that on in December, in January and in February. What's the difference between the previous three eruptions in the Sutnuka crater series and the current one? So there is nothing blocking the flow of magma into the Sutnuka crater series anymore. So it flows right through. It's not you know, before it was flowing and then it was somehow closing down, but that's not the case anymore. And that's why the land rise is stopping. That's why nothing's building up again. As I just said, the water hose flowing right through. But, and here it comes, and here his opinion varies from his colleague. He was asked, does this difference that we see here from the current eruption and the past eruptions say something about about the end of the Sutnuka crater series of events at this time. And he says, no, I don't think we can predict that. It needs to be clear what will happen. And, and that is not clear yet, right? Um, he says that the first land rise in the region started in 2020. After a few weeks, then the land rise stopped, but then it picked up several times before it became really significant last year, ending with that magma intrusion on November 10th. So he says this was not the first event. Um, he says now the influx into that magma, magma chamber has been stable for about five months. And that he thinks is quite a long time because since November 10th, or even earlier been filling up, intrusion, eruption, filling up, eruption, eruption, filling up. It's been steady. It's always kept refilling. And now it looks like maybe not. He says, um, I think we can expect that when it comes down to it, the process will be much longer than it has been. It may well be that the magma flows, the volcanic eruptions and the land rise will stop temporarily for a month or even a year, but it could also continue for a significant period of time. So it is not ruled out that the process that has been going on for the last few months will last one or two years, but there's no certainty about this. That's what he says. He says, we are very far from knowing anything about it. That's what he says. And he says, but if we consider the previous events in this area, it is not at all unlikely that there is a lot left, a lot of power left so that we could see a continuation of the sequence of events in the Sutnuka crater series, because he says, history teaches us there's always more coming than this. So guys, yeah, these two guys, they're colleagues, but I think their opinions vary, but the conclusion that we can draw, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot of speculation, but there's no certainty. They don't know, and as Thorwald or Thorwald and said, he thinks the Icelandic public has a right to know that the scientists don't know and that there is so much insecurity because, you know, 
look at Grindavik, look at the bio plan. They need to know that there is this uncertainty. I mean, they should know by now because you can't make a definitive decision for the town and what to do with it. Good thing is the process is slowly starting that residents will get some money out of this so that they can move somewhere else and be safe. But you know, what else can I say? They know that they don't know, guys. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll close it down. Have a beautiful rest of the Easter Sunday, wherever you are. Um, more coffee is needed for me, guys. The weather is really nice. Um, I want to go out and uh, do some farm work. But, you know, this is saying it's burn season starts here in April. It's November and April, so people are burning their... Um, garden waste. If you're from Europe or especially Germany, you would think, what? <laughs> you know, you're not even allowed to have a fireplace there and you can't burn. You have to have your bin for compost and everything. And I do have a neighbor and this is fascinating to me because it's just a tiny, teeny property. It's not a farm or anything. I think it's less than half an acre, but this guy seems to wait for burn season. He's burning for a week or two. And I'm always wondering, what is he burning? Where does he, right? Um, and, and me being the German, I've never burned anything. When we were clearing the land here for pasture, we had a lot of piles of wood. It was massive, right? And then the Canadian contractor told me, well, just burn it. And I'm like, what? I'll end up in ecological hell. I can't burn this. The neighbors, the, the whole, I mean, this will be like square kilometers of, of smoke. They will just, you know, they will hate me. And then he looked at me and now I understand. He's like, what? And then, you know, so we didn't burn it. Um, but now I know everybody does that here. It's crazy. So month of April and November, it's hard to breathe. And I find it kind of crazy because in summer we have the wildfire season where there is so much smoke. So can not we have like at least a few months because like June, July, August, September is wildfire season. And then November is like burn season where they continue the smoke. And then, you know, April, whatever guys these are just uh it's just i was just today i'm like yeah it's easter let's 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 relax a little bit and go outside and then you're covered in smoke and that guy you know and, and this is like all the piles he he burns his stuff even when it's wet and then they put gasoline on it and whatever and you know how it is in germany one drop of gas or fuel into your ground you have to clean that up right you have to dig it out so um, he's burning everything. I think he's burning his tires and his garbage and his whatever. So it's, um, but it is what it is. I'm, I'm not a fan of starting uh, wars with neighbors, although, um, all over the world, sometimes they, they seem to start the wars with me, but you know how it is if, if you live close by. And I think even if you had like a ranch with, I don't know, 60,000 acres, you would still have a neighbor somewhere who would probably cause you problems. So um, I'm realistic about this. Uh, I don't have like the pink glasses on when it comes to this. So that's a little bit of a background story. And thanks guys, wherever you are, enjoy your evening, morning or whatever. I see you very soon. Check out the videos in the end screen. By the way, it's interesting stuff. Bye-bye.